He took an oath to defend the Constitution of the United States of America. By some, he's been called controversial. I'll keep my freedom. I'll keep my guns. Try to keep my money and my religion too. Now right. keep in mind that gotcha. some of my guests have been approached by old Homeland Security or FBI saying, Oh, uh, why are you going on the Clay Dudley show? My message to those guys that they're listening this morning is go get a cup of coffee, maybe you'll learn something. We both took the same oath, you know, to defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. I don't recall there being an expiration date on that. I'm gonna keep my big VA. Keep my friends the same. Keep the government out of my business and y'all can keep the change. He is the free American, Clay Douglas. We know what we need. We know who to blame. Catch the Free American Hour, weekdays at 7 a.m. Pacific, 10 a.m. Eastern. For the podcast and more details, visit www.freeamerican.com or catch the podcast by phone by calling 832-999-8621. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another edition of the Free American Hour. I'm your host, Clay Douglas. And uh, my guest today is Brad Cattell. He is uh, the founder and owner of Tiny Texas Houses, the builder of Tiny Texas Houses. Hello, Brad. How are you? I'm doing good this morning. How are you doing? I'm doing well, sir. I'm doing well. And uh, I'm excited to have you back on. I've, I've had the one of the last shows that we did with pictures of the Tiny Texas Houses put up on my website and put up on YouTube and a number of things number of different places and uh, I just have to tell you I, I mean you you have created almost exactly what I envisioned almost 20 years ago I envisioned uh, uh, you know, smaller houses you know old style all the charm of the 19th century with all the convenience of the 21st and I believe you've really created that I've got uh, friends associates that have been to your place, that have walked through your building, seen your operation, seen the buildings that you that you're doing, and uh, they're quite impressed. They're quite impressed. I'm good. Good. I'm glad to hear that. It's um, different than anything most people will see, and it um, it's intended to be um, an example of what we are capable of doing again. That's to build things that last forever, that we can be proud of. As Americans, and they're built out of all American products, and they're toxin free, relatively speaking. In other words, there's really no plastics, vinyls, formaldehyde, and all the other chemicals. So I feel like we put together a combination of, of all of the best ingredients um, to build sustainable housing for the future um, and build it out of American energy and American materials so that we can maybe reinstill that sense of pride that we once had in our craftsmanship. And you've got uh, you've you've got forty acres out there on, uh, on I ten outside of San Antonio, uh, within easy driving distance from Austin. And people can come there and and take a look and see the the kind of craftsmanship, can't they? Uh, the uh, craftsmanship is important, I think, that, that, that's critical at this point, and trying to teach kids life skills is what's also so critical at this point, because we're just not teaching them in school anymore. So that, that's really a big, big part of it. The craftsmanship and then the quality of the materials are both issues that I think we've kind of forgotten in this country, and, uh, and I think that's something we need to go back to. We need to remember it again. I agree with that. I, I've, I've uh, written stories about... Uh, <laughs> kind of science fiction stories about about uh, the society or a society that wasn't built on a disposable uh, economy. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I got distracted. That's all right. That's all right. Oh. Uh, uh, we're, we, we, everything is from the 
homes that we build to the cars that we make right now are, are basically yeah, built to be disposable. They, uh, they, oh, they're they not made yeah. to last. Everything. And, and the sad part is that it's supposed to be disposable out of parts and pieces that are brought in from overseas or made overseas. Um, so we're, we're not even getting the benefit of building it in this country anymore crappy. It gets built overseas crappy and we have build it. Or we import the parts of the building crappy out of it. Yeah, you know, we've literally reached a point now where we test things, and if it works 10,000 times and we only want it to work 5,000 times, we'll thin down the metal or reduce the quality of the metal so it intentionally only works 5,000 times. That's insanity why we would build something with that in mind, except that when you get into the corporate mentality, the sociopath mentality of profit, profit, profit at any expense um, to the quality or to the people that are working for you, then it works. It works fine for them. But as an American, um, I'm sick and tired of buying products that'll break intentionally, quickly, so that I'll come back again. And uh, it doesn't have to be that way. It's just simply something we've gone and accepted as the norm. And I think that's what's wrong in America. We've dropped our standards of what we expect. And that's why we don't do any more than we do. By the way, one of my, uh, one of my people in my chat room said, I did a Google search using tiny Texas houses and got 3,360,000 results. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and it's amazing because we've never really advertised, I think, in the life of my business. <clears throat> About six years, we run six ads. And in the very beginning, we ran some ads in uh, Texas monthly. <clears throat> but overall, what appears to be, in my mind, is that there's a, there's a global consciousness coming around. There's a... There's a uh, an awakening that's going on where a lot of people are finally saying, hey, I don't personally need to continue to participate in the destruction of the planet and the destruction of the society, in the uh, dumbing down of our children, um, in the, in basically in the turning a society that is capable of being the smartest in the world into the dumbest in the world by distracting them with mindless, mindless trash and feeding them foods and drugs that will make them as stupid as possible because that's the only way you're going to take down America. You're not going to take down America by hacking it directly. And so for the people who want to control it, I believe that the plan ultimately is to simply break their backs of the common man so that he has nothing else to fight with and take away his weapons and effectively turn them into drones. And I don't agree. I don't choose to participate. I think that 20 million kids deserve the right to drop out and not participate. And, and by the way, uh, you know, my, my vision for, you know, our relationship and what we're doing here, you know, includes Dr. Jake Wade, who's a neighbor of yours. And, and I, since I've been talking with Jake, I, I envision a, a house that's completely livable and you can send your kids to school right out of that home. Yeah, he's got an incredible program where you can actually teach kids everything they need to know to pass the um, requirements for school, which um, in this case pretty much are designed to keep you out of the workforce until you're 18 years old. Um, what Jake has actually been able to do is to actually get kids that were failing in school and to teach them not only to be able to pass the test to get out of school, but to be functional as adults and to come out of effectively what's equivalent of high school, capable of functioning and having their own business and being able to work and teaching them skills as opposed to promising them a college degree that they probably can't afford, won't be able to pay off the debt on, and won't do them any good anyway since only one in five people ever actually work their degree. Um, that's the biggest, biggest fantasy being fed to our children right now that's causing them the most harm is that everybody can get a college degree and make a ton of money when they're done. The fact is, as it turns out, most college degrees do not yield jobs at the end of the college um, curriculum, and consequently, those kids go out with a debt that they will have to pay off for the rest of their lives. It cannot be forgiven, cannot be abandoned through bankruptcy or anything else. So right now, what our children need is to learn life skills again, to learn how to function in society if the electric went off. You know that was that now that's a that is a a definite possibility. I mean, there's a story that probably hasn't hear here too much about uh, India going out sixty six hundred million people 
being without electricity. Now, in my perfect, in my perfect world here, I would be living in your house, which is a, uh, uh, you know, I, I've always asked people, why do you exactly, why do you need two thousand square feet, you know, to live in? I mean, that's a lot of dusting to me, and uh, you know, I don't use that much. Uh, I got a desk, a, a kitchen, and a bed. You know, why am I paying? Why am I paying the bank three times what that house, uh, what I paid for that house over the last, next thirty years? And if, we're, and if we're generating our own electricity out of these places, we're self-sufficient. Now, the, the story has just broken. I think I've got a link up on my website about it, that uh, they just had a conference, and they decided that if, uh, if somebody set off a nuclear blast in the middle of America, up in the air, the EMP would destroy everything that we built, everything we got, and they say oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. millions. It goes better. It's better than that. It doesn't even take a nuclear bomb. All it takes is one solar flare of the right caliber. And we just about got it two weeks ago when we had the largest solar flare blast off and hit our our planet. The largest one we've we've actually been recorded, even recorded in the last twenty, thirty years. And it's just the beginning of a very, very serious cycle that we're going into. What people don't understand is that the solar flare is capable of inducing that EMP into our atmosphere and into our planet without any nuclear bombs. And that EMP will not just take out electrical systems, it also takes out the circuit boards at the end of it, including the circuit boards that lower the nukes down into the water at the nuclear plant to keep them from burning up in emergencies and stuff like that. Um, that EMP you're talking about shuts everything down instantly, no warning. And, uh, yeah, the United States, Russia, and China all know that they don't have to drop bombs on the ground. They just drop it in the air. Yeah, we don't have, to destroy, we don't have to destroy any real estate now. All we got to no, do no, that's right. We can destroy all the, all the um, infrastructure, um, electrically speaking, and cripple the country and send us, send us into effectively a panic um, without ever actually firing a bullet from the rifle. That's right. And and they want you to panic, folks. They want you to panic. Be afraid. Be very, very afraid. Now they just did they they just did this this conference and this had a lot of, you know, high level people that are predicting, you know, ninety million people could die if uh, if something like this happened. If all of our electricity shut down. Now in in my vision to be safe is by is by being able to grow your own food and generate your own electricity right straight from the air from the sun uh, from the wind that God gave us and uh, by if if we don't prepare for it today man what happens in the future if this does happen and and this is a this is the this is the worst case scenario but all it has to take is you know some of the gas we're going through a drought right now lots of part lot, a lot of the country is experiencing our drought and oh, an incredible drought, incredible drought. Yeah. And in fact, is, and, and here's some things, you're, 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 I, I, I agree with what you're saying. The other part of this is the, the um, speed at which things are happening right now so far exceeds anything that the scientists anticipated. For example, Greenland melted off to less than seven days this year. That's the entire ice sheet melted off in less than seven days. It was such a shock that NASA had to go back and re-examine the satellite photos because they couldn't believe it happened. Um, we just went from 11% to 27% of the country in extreme drought in a week. The interesting part about this is it all coincides with um, the, you might say the follow-up from the solar flare that occurred. And people understand that solar flare I'm talking about that shot off at the Earth basically emptied this quadrant of the solar system of pretty much all electrons and protons as it blasted everything out of this quadrant. Our planet the magnetosphere took a huge blast, but effectively we still absorbed the equivalent of probably 50 hydrogen bombs into our atmosphere in one day or one week. Um, out of the billion hydrogen bombs, the equivalent of a billion hydrogen bombs exploding on the planet shot straight at us. That added a lot of heat to our planet, a lot more than anybody's SUV produced in the last week, which I'll guarantee you. And the problem we've got is that global warming while we are contributing to the devastation of our planet and the resources on our planet, the global warming is happening on Mars, on Venus, on Saturn. It's happening on the moons of Jupiter, the methane crystal moons of Jupiter. They're melting. 
um, this is not something that's just the United States and in, in, our, in our world. This is something that's our, our solar system. Our sun is heating up. It's blasting out enormous amounts of energy, and we're absorbing huge amounts of it each time that blast occurs. If anybody isn't looking up into the sky and making that correlation, they're making a huge mistake to try to just blame it on humans and thinking that we can tax people for the amount of carbon they're using, and we're going to basically reduce the temperature in the solar system. That is absolutely absurd. Now, how do we, how do we prepare for this? I mean, if the gov the governments are preparing, they've dug a deep underground military bases, and they'll lock those up in case of a nuclear war, in case of uh, anything. If if anything happens, they got a place to go. Finding all the way, all the right people are loaded, ready to go downstairs. Right, they're going to go ahead and stay downstairs and watch it all happen, and come back up when it's all over with. That's it's the intent. There may um, be some good things happening out of this because we're actually getting national attention. The the whole Libor scandal over in uh, Europe and the tracing of the uh, of the money. There's trillions of dollars in offshore accounts of all these bankers, and uh, they've all stolen it from people of the world. And well, not just the bankers; it's mainly the, the world leaders. You can pretty much throw a huge, huge group of people into that. Sadly, even even going into other countries. Um, Iran, Israel, anywhere you go, the leaders pocket the money um, and hand it off to each other for the most part through what we do. We, we, we hand off uh, you know, all this money to Afghanistan and we know darn well that the biggest problem they've got is corruption. Um, same thing in Iraq. I mean, if the system is corrupt and you hand money over and they just simply start using it to pay off for bribes, you're not, you're not doing anything for the system. You're simply paying everybody off. Um, and that's kind of what we've gotten into doing in the past. Uh, same as right now, we're sitting there in a war in Yemen that most of the American public is unaware of. We've been dropping tomahawk missiles into uh, wedding parties and small villages on behalf of the dictator who's over there in charge and sending our troops in to train his personal military. And yet the public isn't even aware that we are at war in Yemen uh, because their leader has been lying and saying that they're bombs, even though they're coming off of our ships. When the public is unaware that we're out there kicking the ass of a country that we have no that's even visiting, um, that is a problem. And that's what we're having right now. We have multiple scenarios around the world where we are spending our, our men, our boys, our weapons, our, 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 our resources. This is our, our resources for our country. And we're spending them all over the world under the auspices of fighting the Taliban. When in effect, as in Yemen, we are creating the Taliban by killing all sorts of innocent people on behalf of the regime that's in power because they're treating us for ISIS. This has very little to do with the tiny factors house, as I realize, but what it ultimately comes down to is the public, if you want to stop this, you simply stop using the dollar. You simply stop participating. You start bartering. You start downsizing. You start living simple. You stop, stop participating in the consumerism in this country that supports our government's ability to do this. If we start downsizing, we intentionally break the back of the dollar the ability to continue to fight and support these wars if we say I don't want to participate I don't want to be part of this I want us to come back and take care of our people here instead of spending that billion dollars on that war over there come back and take care of the teachers come back and take care of the kids come back and take care of the old people let's get our education system fixed let's do these things for our country instead of go start another war that's what tiny houses is about is thinking simple pulling in shrinking, thinking about the person within and not the things we have that we use to create the persona that now, we want everybody to think we are. Now, I, I, the last show that we did, I had a woman that uh, called in. Uh, she'd been uh, to the my website and she'd got to see it. And she called in and she says, uh, you know, we, we, I really like the idea of Liberty Villagers, but we're already doing that to here in our, uh, our little town in northern Florida, in North Florida. And she described a, a county in which the farmers are all were a farming community, and the farmers are all working together. They're starting to put uh, uh, solar and wind on their on their house. Of course, uh, you know farms have been running off of the wind for a few hundred years here, haven't they? Oh yeah, oh yeah. This is stuff we should be using, right? And and uh, I said, well, you know, that's that's great, and that's exactly what I want to see. I want to see all these farms working together. I don't want a big communal farm. I don't want, but I want people to be able to uh, to come to wherever I am, wherever we have a Liberty Village set up, to do exactly what you're talking about. Learn. 
to well, learn. Here's the, the next step to make that happen is the salvage fair, which is the next part of our the, the villages. Um, the first one we're starting off is going to be called Tiny Texas Territories. That's the one right down here on the side of I-10 and Mooing. And Tiny Texas Territories is going to be comprised of multiple one-acre villages and a market in the middle called Salvage Fair. Yeah. Salvage Fair is designed to be a private membership, um, same as the true salvage living movement is, such that we can determine what gets sold there and what doesn't get sold there. And the primary criteria is it's American-made, American origin, or if it was imported, like uh, maybe Noritake, China, or something was brought in, um, it's used. It's Americanized. Anything Americanized already that's used, I'm all for. But I want to quit importing new stuff. So the flea market, the salvage fair, is going to be all used, all American-made. If it's made out of used stuff, if it can be brand new, made out of used stuff, I'm good for that. And the idea is, is to move toward um, thinking more about bartering and trading this stuff and, and the barter is not taxable. So you bring in a trailer load of, of wood and you barter it for your chickens and some eggs and some uh, clothes and some other things. If you barter that exchange, there's no tax on it. That's what I mean by taking the dollar away from the government to use for a war. We just don't give it to them in the first place legally, legitimately. We're not evading taxes. We're doing what we're allowed to do. The same thing on, on the whole idea of living together in small villages. If I'm helping you and you're helping me and I'm not charging you for it, then there's no tax on it. But if um, you come over and fix my air conditioner and you charge me a thousand bucks, then you pay tax and, and that's a bad deal. But if you fix my air conditioner and I come over and cook you dinner, then it's a fair trade, there's no tax. Now there's other, yeah, there's other uh, ways, Ithaca hours did uh, a remarkable thing. Right, that's another part of the currency that was created too. And if we create um, our own Liberty Village currency that we can trade back and forth, if you've got a homeless veteran, let's say, that uh, put in four hours of work on your property, you can pay him in, uh, you know, an hour that's uh, usable in any of your stores or any of your flea markets or yeah, yeah, or you can pay his rent that way. I okay. mean, it could be a situation where you come in and be able to stay in a tiny house and where you might have a $300 rent normally. Um, you could be putting in an hour of work a day on the property and thus pay his rent. Um, it's, an, it's a fair exchange. It's a bartered exchange that way. And, and, and theoretically, it's an untaxable exchange. Um, that's what we're going toward, um, the ability to, to help each other out of the community without taxing our individual actions on everything we do so the government can take that money and then abuse and, and waste it as they do so so efficiently. Well, the, the, where, where we're building the houses, uh, and, and this, this I see this as being a duplicable. If somebody's got some land in, in uh, let's say, Tennessee, and, and they adopt this principle that, uh, that you've already established of salvage, we're cleaning up the landscape. We uh, we can actually uh, and, and those crews can also go into uh, you know forest and pull out underbrush that you can make mulch out of and the wood chips out of that you put on your gardens. There's there's so many things that you can do if you just want to get productive and understand what we've got here. I mean, God gave us the wind or sun. Why would we pay a Chinese company to go up for electricity? You know, after Obama sold them to the top of a mountain, to put a bunch of well, here it goes even further than that, though. Absolutely, God gave us all this stuff to use. He gave us trees that were hundreds and hundreds of years old that we came to this country and just chopped down with no regard for the consequences later on. And all that lumber is sitting out there. We have a virgin forest standing in this country in the form of dilapidated buildings, barns, and houses. I mean, literally the largest natural forest still existing in this world is standing in this country. We have that many old buildings and old barns and old houses that could be salvaged at this moment. That is the equivalent of any forest standing in the world today. And all we have to do is take the human energy to go out there and dismantle these structures to then warehouse them in all these empty buildings that have been abandoned by the global corporations. And I personally think we should go back and use them in the domain. That, that excellent tool that the government and the rich people use to take away land so they can develop it, that should be then used instead to take back these buildings that the global corporations wrote off. They're zeroed out. Our government has been very kind to them and let them write off these buildings as a loss. Um, and I think that it's only fair that city councils and all these little towns around the country that were hurt 
and the people in those kind of towns who were hurt, that they should be able to go and take that building, through them in a domain, give them a fair value for it, which is what they've written it off to, whatever that is, and then use that to store all these resources. I mean, we have 30 years worth of future resources, and we're throwing them in the dump. Right now, 51% of our landfills are building materials. We cannot ignore this fact when you think about these trees will never be replaced. These me um, metals will never be replaced. We no longer have the mines to, to get the iron ore. We no longer have the refineries to refine it. We no longer have the people to work in the refineries if we have the refineries. And what are we doing with that situation as it is and our inability to replicate resources that we're throwing away? We are shipping iron to China and steel to China for $60 a ton. And we can't even dig it out of the ground, mine it, smelt it, and produce that iron or that steel for that price. So we're making it possible for them to put a 20,000 pound tank on the ground for $1,200 worth of metal. Now they can't mine it in their country. They can't. They can't um, make that steel in their country for that price, even with their labor costs. They can't do that. They're better off buying it from us. So just like in World War II, when we went out and asked the public to donate all their steel and all their copper, all their brass, all their metal, so we could go and fight the war, we're sending all that to them right now voluntarily. We're giving them all the things, all the ingredients they need to build an army with the two billion people they got to work with. Their army is bigger potentially than the population of our country. So it is crazy to send all this stuff over there when we have the future of our children to worry about and it goes right now. In another 10 years, we will have to import everything, the iron, the steel, everything, because we'll have given up all the skills, all the knowledge, all the facilities to produce it with. Now, that will all be gone. Brad, when I talk about this, and uh, we got uh, we got about uh, four more minutes uh, here left on this half, but uh, when I talk about this, you know, the objections I get, because uh, I tell people, you can do this in your neighborhood. If you just got out and walked around to all your neighbors and said, look, we're going to launch a, a, a little uh, village project here, a little community project, and uh, we're going to do uh, articles on about it, film it, and all that. We'd like for you to, uh, you know, dig up the grass in your backyard and, and plant vegetables or plant uh, trees or plant uh, something that uh, you can eat. And uh, we want you to put uh, solar and uh, generator on your house and start letting your house make money for you. And the the reactions are well, they the, the the neighborhood association won't allow you to do that. Well, zoning won't allow you to do that. Well, 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 well. Uh, they, uh, I, I, I don't think you're gonna uh, put that kind of structure out here. Where you got to get a building permit. You got to get all this. Now, this it, it that varies from a neighborhood to neighborhood, from town to town, from state to state. But uh, is this it a doesn't very much? No, it doesn't vary a whole lot. Um, Keep in mind, there's a couple things that went on, and this is what people forget, and that's the National Code, National Building Code, while it appears like it's out there to help everybody out, not to help and give them guidance on what you should do to build. Well, National Building Code, if you think about it, and this is the reality of it, um, up until the 1950s, we were building with salvage lumber all the time, and we had houses all over the country. We'd take down a house, take all the parts and pieces, and go use them to build another house. Well, the lumber industry, for example, um, is a... Is a Giant, um, Temple Inland, Warehouser, and Georgia Pacific, being the three largest of their kind, um, looking at the world, I suspect went, gee, you know, we have total control of this situation if it weren't for that darn salvage lumber. It's messing us up here. Otherwise, we have no competition left. And so, National Code, what it does is each small town, instead of making up their own code, they simply adapt, adopt a, a, a national code or an international code, thing which when they choose. When they do that, all the big industry had to do was say, as part of the code, no new construction with salvaged wood. That one little part of national code destroyed the salvage industry in our country through the 60s and eliminated it pretty much the 60s and the 70s because you can no longer use it to build with, structurally speaking, even though it is superior to anything on the market today. Um, that one move right there wiped out the salvage industry and until we go in at a local level 